those of y'all who are at home, if you've made palm branches, palm crosses, whatever it is, uh, the kids can carry them around the room right now. It'll be a good time for them to dance and have fun. Here we go. Well, good morning, church family and friends. Uh, Pastor Bill Price here. We welcome you to this service of worship today on this Palm Sunday, Passion Sunday. So glad that you could join in with us. I want to remind you that our youth director is actually going to be monitoring the live stream from her home this morning. So we welcome your comments and your full participation today. Hope you will do that. We also welcome those that are going to be joining on the radio at noon today. And even though we're currently in a shelter-in-place situation in our state, we still hope to have these live worship services for you, and especially in these times of this pandemic. We truly need to worship the Lord and give praise to our God and pray together for God's protection, watch care over us all, and also to give thanks to know that our Lord is with us in these days. We uh, want to be the church, and especially in these uh, and these days, this is Holy Week, Palm Sunday, as we move toward Easter Sunday, we still serve a risen Savior, thanks be to God. A couple of things to note this morning, our office is going to be closed starting this Monday until safer times, until the shelter in place is lifted. You can still reach the church office, still phone the church office. If you need to get, get in touch with me or any of the staff, you can still do that. We want to be here for you. Any needs that you have that we can uh, help you with, please let us know that. Again, you can still call the church office, even though it will physically be closed until we get through the shelter-in-place situation. Once again, thank you for joining us today. We hope you will fully participate when we're singing. We hope you'll be singing at home. When we're praying, we hope you'll be praying at home and your full participation as we worship the Lord together. Uh, as we begin the service, uh, and uh, something that the church has been saying for centuries, the core beliefs of our church, especially you affirm those in these difficult times, the Apostles' Creed. May you join with me as we affirm together what we believe. Church, what do we believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you for sharing what we believe today with me. Now let us continue in worship with more music. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, power wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, power wonder-working power, power in the blood of a lamb. There is power, 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 power wonder-working power, power in the precious blood of a lamb. What can wash us?
Amen. As we come to these moments of prayer together, I know there are many needs, many needs in our world, in our nation, in our communities, in our personal lives, in our families. But I invite you to join me as we come to these moments to pray together. And then afterward, I invite you to pray with me the Lord's Prayer. And as I think about that as well, I hope you are able to join us on our pray down at high noon. It's one of those uh, other things that we're trying to do to stay in connection with you on a daily basis and also the importance and value of our prayers uh, together as the people of God. So let us center our thoughts and our hearts on God as we go to these moments of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we know today as we come into your presence, presence that you see this world in great need. We thank you, God, that although we cannot fully understand all the things that are happening through this pandemic, we are trusting in your unchanging grace. And God, on this day, on this Palm Sunday, Passion Sunday, you demonstrated your love for us unlike no other in the giving of your son. God, it reminds us of how much you love us, how much you care for us. And we thank you that Jesus, as our great high priest, enters into our sufferings. So in those places, God, where need is great in these moments, in those places, Lord, in our world, in our nation, where there is suffering, where people are suffering, we pray you as our great high priest would enter in through your Holy Spirit to those places of greatest need. We'd also ask, God, that you would deliver us from further suffering, that your protection be around us, God, and especially those who are working on the front lines. We remember those, God, as our health care professionals, doctors, those, God, who are working still in grocery stores and banks, those, God, who are still providing care and help to others in these difficult days. We pray, God, that you would renew their strength. And we pray you would further put a hedge of protection around them and the work that they do. But, Lord, we pray that you would also help us to be listening for what you might be saying to us in these days. And, God, even in a greater sense of connection that we might not normally have, the neighbor we may pass by, the phone call we may not make, the email we may not send, maybe we'll send that now. Maybe that phone call we'll make. Maybe we'll lift that prayer today for our neighbor that we might pass by. God, we pray your mercies to help us to discern how you would have us respond in these days as your church. We thank you, God, again for your love for us, the full extent of your love that is unconditional and unending through your son Jesus. We pray we would feel and know your love, especially in these days and on this Palm Passion Sunday and into this Holy Week. Guide us, God, we pray that we might know and do your will above all else, even as we pray the, the prayer that the Lord Jesus has taught us. So let us pray boldly. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for praying with us today. And now our children's time with Miss Jennifer. Hey guys, good morning. I am so excited to be here this Palm Sunday morning, but saddened that you are not here with me. I hope this week that you got our message and that you made your palm branch craft with your family's hands. I made mine. This is Mr. J and Madeline's hands and mine, and I hope that you have it with you. So today is such an awesome day because today is the day that Jesus came into Jerusalem on a donkey and the people were having a parade. And so I want us to be able 
able to do that today. We didn't get to search around, walk around and wave our palm branches, but today we are going to do something. So I want everybody to stand up on your feet, all kids, all children of all ages, even the little ones. And I want you to take your palm branch and we're going to do something together. I want you to wave it up in the air and I want you to say, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Okay. So that's a lot to say, but I think we can do it. Are you ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. Three, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That was awesome. Good job, guys. Um, I learned something that I wanted to share with you. When I went last year on my trip to Israel, I learned that Hosanna has a lot of meanings. But to us, it means that we are praising God and we are saying we are so excited. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But the Hebrew meaning that I didn't know means, Lord, help us and save us. And our Lord, our Savior, this week is the beginning of the week where we learn and we know that Jesus died on the cross to save us. And how fitting that this week of all weeks, we get to say, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, save us. Save us from anything, from our sadness, from being inside, from missing our friends, and to save us for eternal life. So I hope this week you will run around your house saying, Hosanna in the highest with me, as I will be doing that. Hang your palm branch on your door and take a picture and, and post it on our website. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, save us. Lord, redeem us. Almighty God, come and be present this week. Be with us as we worship you, as we remember how you sacrificed your life. Let us take time to spend with you. Let us take time in remembering our life and our love for you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. And let's pray for our offering this week. Lord, you give us everything, and we want to give back with grateful hearts. I pray that we would be uh, centered on you and prepared to hear your word uh, to us, how you want us to reach out to others, uh, mainly to our family, since that's who we're sequestered to. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
It'd be hard for us to imagine that those on the road that day who were shouting, Hosanna, 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 blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were proclaiming Jesus as the deliverer, as the savior. What's so quite amazing is that same crowd who were shouting Hosanna later would be shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Today we focus not just on Palm Sunday, but also on Passion Sunday. And the words that I share with you today are going to be more oriented toward uh, the passion of Christ. The scripture is John 19, 28 through 30. I invite you to follow along with me in your Bible at home. If you have that, this is John 19, 28 through 30. Hear now the word of the Lord. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of wine on the branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. For those of you joining in today on Facebook and also later in the radio, we're continuing our series on this Lenten series on a text we've been using by David Long entitled Quest for Holiness, Deadly, From Deadly Sin to Divine Virtue. And we've been talking about deadly sins and how they often rule in our lives and in our world. But also, and more importantly, how those deadly sins can be transformed by the grace of God so that we can live by divine virtues, characterized by the image of God being restored in us so we can, in our lives, manifest the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And today we talk about the deadly sin of gluttony and its virtuous counterpart, abstinence. Now, some may think it odd, and on the surface, it certainly does seem to be talking about gluttony on Palm or Passion Sunday, but perhaps more the virtue of abstinence would be in place here. It's difficult for us in the modern day to imagine this barbaric, torturous death on a cross, but let's reflect over it a moment. After all, it is Passion Sunday. Humanly speaking, when Jesus was placed on a cross, he could not do anything. His feet and hands were nailed securely onto that cross. He couldn't make any movement. Jesus even struggled to breathe. But here, one of the last seven words of Christ is spoken, I thirst. They offered him sour wine to drink. It was the only food or drink he was offered and here in this state, he was physically unable to nurture himself or indulge in anything, practically. Let's think further about this scene. On the cross, he was literally hung between heaven and earth. Jesus was totally held captive, at least from a human perspective. But if we view this scene from a heavenly perspective, it is a totally different story. In his final act of Jesus' life before his resurrection and ascension, he was fully obedient to the plan of God for the salvation of the world, more personally your salvation and my salvation. We can say in the most profound spiritual way that Jesus nailed our sins to the cross when he died. The Bible tells us Jesus died for our sins. He took our place. He freely gave himself to suffer our penalty. But the great reality is the cross was a part of God's plan from the foundation of the world. Revelation 13, 8 reminds us Jesus is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And Jesus never lost sight of his destiny, his mission. He fully complied with the will of God, even though it was costly and painful. Philippians 2.8 tells us that he was obedient unto death, even death of a cross. So here he says, it is finished. The mission to bring salvation to the world, to redeem humanity, to bring forgiveness of our sins is now accomplished through Jesus' death on the cross. Ephesians 1.7 puts it like this, in him we have redemption through his blood, 
the forgiveness of our sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Now, you may wonder, how in the world does this have anything to do with the sin of gluttony? And we mostly think of gluttony as overindulgence, particularly regarding food. But this understanding of gluttony is superficial, and I think we need a better definition than what we often think about in our minds. In their workbook on the seven deadly sins, Maxie Dunham and Kim Reisman give a better understanding of gluttony. Here's what they say. At its root, gluttony is addiction to pleasure. It is indulged, and if we indulge over a period of time, pleasure diminishes and greater indulgence is necessary to produce the same level of pleasure. It's a vicious cycle. And it's overindulgence of any of the body's appetites. And the emphasis there on any of the body's appetites. What we're emphasizing here is that Jesus was in full compliance and obedience and agreement with God's will and direction, even though it meant a painful cross. Once again, gluttony is not just about food, but it involves that which deters us or distracts us from fulfilling God's greater purpose and will for our lives. We say gluttony happens when we are overindulging in things that are not God's best for us. The, the difficult part of this is that these things are often good things, even things that may bring us pleasure. But in essence, we misplace the use of our time and our talent and our treasures, or we spend our goods, including food, to satisfy our own desires without any thought toward God. One commentator put it like this, gluttony is not about having body fat, it's about having a gaunt soul, shall we say, an empty soul. Let's take a quick look back in time from Mount Calvary and the cross in Jesus' life back to the Garden of Gethsemane. What happened in the Garden of Gethsemane? Jesus prayed. Here is a pivotal moment when Jesus surrendered his will to God's will. And notice the words that Jesus uses in all four of the Gospels this is mentioned. Jesus prayed that the cup would pass from him. And it's significant, I think, that all four Gospels speak about Jesus praying about drinking from this cup. Let's use the text in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 26, 39. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. Now, it's interesting to me that Jesus talked about a cup, a cup that he was going to be drinking from. Of course, this is a symbolic cup. It's a cup that speaks to us of what Jesus would endure. It was a cup of suffering. Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen. He had already foretold that to his disciples that he was going to be handed over and be crucified. He knew the cup of suffering meant that his blood was going to be shed shed for our world. But I find it interesting that Jesus used this reference to a cup here. Well, this cup is a long way from our big gulp cola at our local convenient mart. It's a long way from that Coke Icy that we might get at Sam's. It's a long way from that Red Bull energy drink that many of us use. It's a long way from that Starbucks white chocolate latte that we might use to refresh ourselves on some mornings. This cup is the polar opposite of those things. It was a cup of bitterness. Yes, the only thing that would be offered to Jesus' dying lips was a sour vinegar wine. More brutal and bitter was his cup than perhaps any we will ever drink in our lives. But let's go back a little bit further in the gospel and look at the temptation of Jesus. Here again is another reference to food. You remember this scene? Jesus had fasted. He abstained for 40 days from solid food. Now remember now that abstinence is the opposite of gluttony. We've been in this shutdown. I couldn't help but think about this as Jesus is fasting for 40 days. I couldn't help but think now that we've been in this shutdown for over three weeks. And now we have the whole month of April ahead of us. 
And we're held in so much uncertainty in these days. Now think about this for a moment. Not having anything in your cupboard. No food. Nothing to eat. Not even peanut butter. Or a can of Campbell's chicken noodle soup. Nothing. Let's be real here. For most of us who are listening today, even though we are confined to our homes as we are, there may be a strong temptation for many of us to turn into what we call a couch potato. Our normal activities are gone. We're huddled up in our homes. But most of us probably have our, our cupboards stocked with food or the ability to get food. And in our worry and anxiety over this virus, which is very real, we may have a tendency to eat, to eat, and to eat some more. I'm seeing pictures of this on social media all around, common now. And we talk about comfort food, which is a very real thing in these days. Or we have impulsive eating because we're bored. Or perhaps to relieve our anxiety. And so we eat and we eat. And if not careful, even in the midst of this crisis and these troubling days, which are so real, and the confinement that we're going through, we can struggle with gluttony itself. But think about this. This temptation of Jesus was quite different. There was 40 days of fasting, abstaining from real food. So during this fasting period, the devil comes and says to Jesus, turn these stones to bread. And here we might explain, expand on this and what is implied in the statement of Satan to Jesus. Satisfy your own desires above everything else. You have the power to do anything. Use your power to feed yourself. God has abandoned you out in the middle of nowhere. You're starving to death. Now you can do something about it. Turn these stones to bread and satisfy your hunger. Now, I'm so glad that this is Jesus and he passed the test. I'm not sure what I would have done after 40 days without real food. I think I would have been tempted to turn that stone into the biggest Twinkie on the planet. It would be like Jesus in his later miracle. I would have made a Twinkie so big it would have fed 5,000 people with 12 baskets of Twinkies left over. And when I say that, there's a real recognition that I'm a lot like my original parents, Adam and Eve, still eating forbidden fruit, still going beyond the boundaries God has established, living out of our own selfish desires. And speaking of Adam and Eve, let's go back to the book of beginnings, into another garden. At the very beginning of creation, the Garden of Eden, Eve was allured by Satan to eat the forbidden tree, Interesting, one of the characteristics of that forbidden tree that it was pleasing to look at, and yes, it was good for food. So Eve and Adam ate the fruit, but what was the consequence? Were they satisfied? You might say they were immediately satisfied. They filled their bellies, but they lost sight of the greater meaning and purpose for which God had created them. They lost sight of the true meaning and purpose of life. They became self-directed rather than God-directed. They became self-centered rather than God-centered. In essence, we may say that they filled their belly, but they lost their soul. They lost their relationship with God. And this is the essence of gluttony. God was calling them to abstain, but they indulged. And how often we fall into this trap of trading eternal things of significance for only temporary pleasures. And that's just the problem with sin, and particularly the sin of gluttony. It takes something that is a means and makes it an end. It's an overemphasis, an overindulgence, an exaggeration of the importance and priority of some things that prevent us from really doing God's will, what God wants us to do. This makes us less than what God has created us to be. In essence, sin diminishes us and those around us because we settle for less than what God desires for us. 
We are feeding our own desires and self-will rather than surrendering, as Jesus did, to the greater will of God. We place greater emphasis on the perishing things on this earth, which will not last, rather than the eternal things of God, which are unending. I think perhaps one of the consequences of this coronavirus is that it is sobering. It is sobering us to realize that we are yet mortal beings. Our time here at best is short. We need to center our lives around our creator and redeemer. Put it, uh, Jesus put it like this. What would it profit you if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? Have that empty got soul. This is what Adam, Adam and Eve were doing and what we are still strongly tempted to do today. But thanks be to God, Jesus overcame where our original parents failed. And he comes to bring a whole new creation. Jesus did not fall to the deception of satisfying his own desires. Make no mistake here, this was a real test of what Jesus was going to do. It was a prelude to the cross. If Jesus had failed here, he would have never made it to the cross. He would not be the sinless Lamb of God to, to be sacrificed for us for our forgiveness and salvation. But hear what Jesus said to the devil. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from God. The devil was using food as a device to distract Jesus from his real mission. And going back to what we said earlier, gluttony is not just about food, although food is commonly used here. But food was the source to try and get Jesus to satisfy his own self, to focus on what he wanted, not what God wanted. Jesus was called to abstain from physical food, to receive the spiritual food from heaven, from God. And that's exactly what he did. Man does not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from God. So how about you and me today? Where are we in this picture? Paul writes in Philippians, and I want to emphasize here, especially as we talk about the cross of Jesus on this Passion Sunday, he identifies those whom he deems as enemies of the cross. In other words, those who are living in a manner that opposes how Jesus lived and it opposes the nature of what the cross represents in our lives. Here's how it reads. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's fascinating that one of the key characteristics he identifies here in this statement is he says, those who are enemies of the cross, their God is their belly. Quite clear that enemies of the cross have a direct link to gluttony. Now, obviously, this is talking figuratively about those who have overindulged or overemphasized or placed too great a value on earthly things. I heard a somewhat humorous story of a young man who went into a hardware store up to a bit of mischief. He didn't steal anything, and he didn't cause any problems overtly with the customers, but he did something he thought was funny. He switched the price tags on several items in the store. A riding lawnmower was $5. Wouldn't you like that? But a pair of trimming shears were $4,000. A power generator was $10, and a light bulb was $1,000. Not 1,000 watts, $1,000, right? The values were totally inverted by the switch price tags. The value of the product had been switched and the cost did not match the real value. It was a silly prank, but might it have a greater meaning for us today? When we think about our lives, have we rearranged the price tags, placed greater value on things that are not really important? And this shutdown period, perhaps, is a great time for us to review and reassess our lives and maybe think about what is most important. Perhaps we place too much emphasis on things that are not really God's will for us. 
Maybe we become gluttons of pleasure, living by our feelings, what makes us feel good at almost any cost. Maybe this shutdown is a time of forced abstinence from our normal routines and activities in life, the ball games, the movies, the social gathering, the business events, casinos, even schools. Maybe it's a time for us to reprioritize what is most important in our life. My daughter posted a note recently to me that read, before we go back to life as normal, it might be a great time to evaluate what normal things are worth going back to. There's a great passage in Isaiah that talks about food items once again and how we so often misplace the price tags and assign greater value to things that are not truly important. Listen carefully to Isaiah 55, verses 1 and 2. Come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. And here's the pivotal question. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good. And you will delight in the richest affair. Some time ago, I was traveling outside of Gilbert Town, Alabama. I came across a little country store that had a sign that read, Hot Dogs and Other Fine Food. I chuckled to myself as I read that sign. And all this to say, we all have different tastes, different things that may cause us to indulge ourselves. In our part of the world, we might delight and connect a sausage or that porterhouse steak, or more exorbitant dishes placed before us. But in reality, do these things really satisfy us? There is a hunger and thirst for something deeper in us. These things only fill us for a moment. There's a hunger and thirst for something deeper planted in us by our Creator God. There's a thirst and hunger inside of us that can only be satisfied by our God. Maybe we're seeking satisfaction in things that only leave us wanting more. Like the woman at the well. The song says so truly she was thirsting for the things in life that could not satisfy Jesus told her that he was going to give her water, living water, that she would never thirst again. Come on now, are you kidding me? What does this mean? It means she had met the only one who had the power of life. She had met the one who would die to give us eternal life. Our Christ hung on a cross and thirsted so that you and I would never thirst again. He offers life, abundant and eternal, to all who follow and believe him. It's one of our great songs, contemporary song says today, if we ever needed Jesus, we need him now. The scripture says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us, even the sin of gluttony, living only for ourselves, bowing down to the gods of entertainment or the God that is our belly. If we confess, he is faithful and just to forgive and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I invite you to do that today. And what greater day could we do this than on this Passion Sunday? Let us pray. Jesus, thank you for dying on a cross to forgive us of all of our sins. And Lord, we pray you would forgive us, especially for giving in to our own pleasures when you're calling us to something higher. On this Passion Sunday, Lord, if we ever needed you, we need you now. And so we come and we surrender and bow before your cross and pray for your forgiveness and cleansing and renewing in our lives so that we can become more and more like Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.
third verse, see from his head. again, thank you for joining us today in worship. We hope you'll join us again uh, next Sunday at 10 a.m. and at noon on the radio as well. And may God continue to watch over you, bless you, and keep you in the days of this pandemic. Go in God's peace. The peace of God go in you. Amen.